Welcome to today's episode of Rainer on Leadership. I am one of your co-hosts, Sam Rainer, and no, my father has not reversed his aging. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, we do have a special guest, although you're not, are you special and are you a guest, Matt? Are, are you either of those things? I think I've been on as a guest before, but never a guest host. Ah, Okay. <laughs> Um, Matt, actually, Matt McCraw, Dr. Matt McCraw, who has a terminal degree, which is an inside joke at yes. Church Answers, because we hired you not knowing that you had a terminal degree. And then when my father found out that you had, you know, quite a bit of academic credentials, he just seemed to run with that and he was very pleased. So uh, we'll call you Matt for today's episode, but uh, you really are deserving of the doctor title. Just thought you might want to know that. Well, I appreciate you resurrecting that, uh, teasing me for having a terminal degree that went on for about a year and now it's been <laughs> resurrected. So thank you, Sam. Yeah, you're welcome. We should bring that joke back. Uh, no, Matt McCraw is actually in Bartow, Florida, a lead pastor, and you and I are kind of neighbors. We're not, I mean, you're right up the road from me, but hour and a half, how far are you from me? It's about an hour and a half. Yeah. Okay. Right, right, that's about right. Unless you're going to Disney. And in that case, if you're on I-4, it's six hours. Um, because it's just torture. Yeah, it's a long way to Disney, definitely. But we have a, a great topic for today. Um, Non-denominational churches are becoming more popular, and so you have two Baptists who are going to talk about this. Like, why, why are we qualified to talk about this? But hey, before we do, I want to thank our sponsor. California Baptist University uh, is an incredible school, and they've been a longtime sponsor of the show. I know many of you have expressed interest in CBU, as it's called. Uh, they have a new program in organizational leadership. And as somebody who also I have, I have a terminal degree too, Matt, and I have a PhD in leadership, and that's just really braggadocious of me to say, but I really like organizational leadership, and this program is top notch. So it's an online program. It's designed with the working professional in mind, and it will equip you with sought after leadership skills that are essential to the success of you and your staff. Um, it's great for churches, really great for any, if you lead any organization. Um, classes for the organizational leadership bachelor's degree include the topics of exercising influence, complex pro problem solving, teamwork, decision-making, and conflict management, which is very important in the church. So you can learn more about this at calbaptist.edu. Classes start every eight weeks, so you really can get started at any time once you decide to do it. It's just another eight-week cycle. Uh, so again, calbaptist.edu to go learn more about their organizational leadership program. All right, Matt. Um, Ryan Burge, who's also on the Church Answers team, he's one of our researchers, uh, lead. He's our lead researcher. Um, he's done a lot of good research in this area in non-denominational churches, especially as he compares them to denominational churches. Um, and what you've been around a while, you've been pastoring a while. What do you, let me just start with, what do you feel like when, when, when you're talking about a non-denom church as somebody who is in a denomination, we're both in a denomination, like, do you have any like initial thoughts of like, this is just how it makes me feel? Uh, I think one of the things uh, since I've been, because I not only have been pastoring for a little while, but I grew up in churches. I mean, I, I was actually in the same church most of my life and um, until I went to seminary. And I think one of the things I've noticed over the years is that uh, non-denominational churches seem to grow faster. Uh, even as a kid, I noticed that. And I think also it sometimes does raise the question of what do they believe? They're non-denominational, but they believe something. And so those are kind of just some of the two main things that have stuck in my head about non-denominational churches over the years. I think some uh, folks who are really committed to their denomination sometimes have a negative opinion of non-denominational churches, but I've never felt that way personally. Um, and I think a, a lot of that is because I've been a part of good churches that were part of denominations. So uh, I just felt like it was just another option, but, but those things have really stuck out in my mind that they grow quicker and that sometimes you have to try to figure out, well, what do these churches actually believe? Yeah, like you, I don't want to have a a preset negative uh, perception of really any tribe 
for that matter. You, you know, you, you would hope that you would think the best of people to start with. I mean, why would you go into any sort of relationship with, you know, a pessimism? I mean, you should go in with optimism and just hoping for the best. But I guess my initial thought when somebody says non-denominational, and I don't know that I'm right about this. This is just kind of what pops in my brain is a theological. Like they're not, they're not, you know, against the Bible. They're most of them preach the Bible. They preach the word of God, but they are very um, non-committal on certain doctrinal distinctives that make denominations what they are. And I think that's a more of a common thing in non-denominational churches. And I've, I've encountered it many, many times where, uh, you know, you have a non-denominational church and they'll do things, and not all of them do this, of course, but I, I know of some who do this, where people are coming from a particular faith tradition that does communion every week. And not every non-denominational church does communion every week. So they've got a room over here that if you want to take communion after the service, you can. Uh, and so there's a bit of a theological non-commitment that comes with being non-denominational in, in some of them, not all of them. Now, some, non, some non-denominational churches are actually very committed theologically, and they have very particular things that they believe. But I think my initial thought when I hear, of, oh, they're a non-denominational church, I just think, well, they, they really don't put a stake in the ground with a lot of the distinctives that make Baptist what Baptist is or Methodist what Methodist is. I don't know if that's a bad thing. I mean, there are certain things that we've fought over theologically that we really we really shouldn't. And in that way, I think the non-denominational church gets things more right sometimes than some of the tribalism that we have even like in our own tribe. Yeah, I think you're right about that, Sam, on, on all accounts, really. I think that is a, a major assumption for a lot of people when they think of non-denominational churches. And I also agree with you that we shouldn't fight over tertiary issues that, you know, at times like we always do. And uh, or I should say we often do. And perhaps that's something that some non-denominational churches do better than those who are strongly committed to their denomination. So let me release some research live on the air. All right. I'm ready. I'm ready. Um, so we've just done Church Answers, has, uh, Church Answers Research has just done a big research project. And uh, we compared the uh, perspectives of churched people with unchurched people. So we ask questions about the church, the same questions to a group of unchurched people and then a group of churched people. Now, I, I think you've probably read the report. Do you know what the preference is for churched people? What Do they prefer non-denom or denominational for churched people? Yeah, church people prefer denominations. They do. But yes. unchurched people prefer non-denominational. That's right. So I thought that was an interesting distinctive. There are a ton of more things to release in that report. That's just one small piece of information that we uncovered. And when it is released, we will let you know. Um, we'll certainly be putting that research out. And I, I think, Matt, I think our decision is to, to put it out for free. Um, that's great. So, that's great. I know. It's great I know. research. I have had a chance to get a sneak peek. It's it's great research. And thank you, Chaney and Associates, for for sponsoring the um uh the, the research project. We couldn't have we couldn't have done it without them. I mean, we you know it's expensive to do research, and Chaney and Associates was very very grateful to uh, to sponsor that. Um, okay, so churched people who come from faith traditions tend to prefer those faith traditions. Unchurched people who really don't have a perspective much about the church would just say, you know, I'm just going to do non-denominational. Um, we are seeing non-denominational churches tend to grow, and they're actually growing with um, more Catholics moving in. There is a, a Catholicism to non-denom pipeline that is very large right now. Historically, a lot of non-denominational churches grew at the expense of other denominational churches in the area. Um, but you know, why is it that we're seeing a, a, an abandonment of denominations? Like what, what's going on? Well, I think uh, we've seen some of this historically when non-denomination, non-denominational churches were good at reaching um, those people who left some smaller churches. Sam, you've, you've spoken a lot about that in, in the recent past. 
about how they may have been the exciting new church going on and they were getting some of that transfer growth of you, as you've demonstrated time and again. So I think that's part of the issue. But I also think, particularly when you think of those exiting the Catholic church, I think the Catholics have some competitive assumptions about Protestant denominations. And I think it's the same way going the other way. Protestant denominations have competitive assumptions about Catholics at times. And so I think they would, may, if they choose to leave the Catholic church, they may say, hey, I'm looking to go to a non-Catholic church, but I don't want to go to that type of church and fill in the blank, whatever denomination it might be. And so the non-denominational church seems like more of a receptive place to them. And as you've already demonstrated from the, the recent, to be recently uh, coming research, is those who aren't believers or, or those who aren't churched, they don't have any of those assumptions. So they just, well, they're open to, to whatever. And the non-denominational churches are often uh, doing a better job with welcome ministry, first impressions, being open to guests and things like that. So I think those are some of the reasons we're seeing that. But one thing we do know across the board, whether you're a part of a denomination, whether you're non-denominational, or whether you don't even know what you are, <laughs> if you're a church, the challenge is still conversion growth. Absolutely. The vast majority of growth in large churches, and I know not all large churches are non-denominational, but that has been a trend of larger churches tending to be either loosely affiliated with their denominations, or you don't even know if they are, or non-denominational. Um, the vast majority of them grew at the expense of transfers from other other churches, as you mentioned. And that's just stats. That's just facts. You may have one in your area where you're like, no, 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 they're a big non-denominational church and they've reached plenty of people for Christ. And hey, that's good. I, that's what they should be doing. But statistically, if you look at all of them as a whole, most of them either grew because they were planted in a growing suburb and just people were moving there, which, you know, that's good. Somebody has to, you, somebody has to put a church there. Or they just had a lot or, and or had a lot of people coming from other smaller churches. So the challenge today, the median church size is now 65 people. There's no more people to pull from. Like <laughs> the transfer growth era is over. I mean, maybe we got a few, you know, three or four or five more years left in it. I don't know. Uh, but churches are now getting so small that you, you, there's just no one to pull from. So we are entering into a new era, whether you are denominational or not. Guess what? The way you're going to grow is to reach new people in your community who are moving there, having families that have kids, and reaching people for Christ. You're not going to be able to grow anymore with just people come from other, from other churches. Yeah, absolutely. It's 100%. Not to mention, and as, as, as you obviously know, is that's the mission Jesus gave us, is to reach people for conversion growth. And so uh, we, we whether you're, like you said, whether you're denominational or non-denominational, this has to be the first task of l making disciples, leading people to conversion and growing as a result of that. Yeah. And uh, with the growth of non-denominational churches, um, networks have become more popular. Uh, I will call them um, neo-denominations or non-denomination denominations um you know there's <laughs> some of these so-called networks crack me up and a lot of them are good a lot of them are really good they do a lot of good i have no problem with somebody creating a church network please go do it uh if you think you can do kingdom work i've got no issue with that but it really cracks me up we're not a denomination we're a network i was recently talking with somebody and he was giving me uh he was a leader in this network and he was giving me all of the parameters that they put on their churches. You know, we, we do this, we do this, we require this, we require this. And you know, he was saying it in the context of, hey, we have high standards. You know, we're, we're actually doing what we should be doing. And it, it really was good. And I just looked at him and I said, you know, that's all really good stuff. You're a denomination. You call, you call yourself a network, but you're... Yeah. You could label it a little differently, but you're denominated. He, he looked back at me. He gave me a look. Um, we eventually, uh, we came to terms and it was fine. But um, <laughs> he gave me a look like, no, we are not. Uh, but I was like, oh, you, you kind of are. You kind of are. Uh, yeah, I think that some, being, some, some of these networks, ahead. 
maybe think they're not denominations. It's just because they're smaller. And it's like, no, you're just a small denomination. <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly right. You know, we of every church we plant, we require them to return a certain percentage, you know, after they're planted back to this network. I'm like, boy, that's, you know, and then we have a theological statement that we make you adhere to, and you have to put people through our processes. It's like, that really sounds like a denomination. Um, so there is some, p- part, of, a part of it is, it's just newer. And so you're able to market yourself in a different way. I mean, if you're United Methodist or Southern Baptist or, or name your tribe Catholic, um, you know, that you have a long history there that is very hard to escape. Um, now, that could be good for you. That could be bad for you, um, depending on what's in the history and how people perceive you. Uh, but a new network that acts like a denomination doesn't have that historical baggage so they can kind of kind of call themselves what they want to call call themselves yeah i i agree 100 percent. and i think one thing that uh we need to keep in mind here too is that some of these non-denominational churches have been around for a while i mean sam you and i are close to the same age and so we we both probably remember some large non-denominational churches from when we were kids and some of those have been around for a while. So I think it's, um, whereas these networks and these neo denominations can be helpful and not have all that baggage. I think it's also, as you look at denominations, it should be a warning for, for all those leaders to keep their eyes focused on the mission that Christ has given them. And also to, to not be distracted by some of these other things that have distracted denominations, because after a while, the same thing could happen to the non-denominational churches or the networks that um, may be non-denominational. Same thing can happen if they keep their eyes off the task. Yeah, and hear me out. I don't want this to come across as anti-denominational at all. Uh, Institutions are very important to the fabric of American society, not just church institutions and denominations, but any institutional work in the United States um, is, is important. Um, so I look at even something like, you know, the Chamber of Commerce or civic organizations or, um, you know, the academic institutions that are out there. Uh, it's a nice thought when somebody says, let's release ourselves from all of this historical baggage and overhead and all the things that are associated with the institution. But the thing the institution provides is a foundation and funding. So, you, you know, denominations are not a bad thing um, at all. Uh, in fact, I would argue that there are some really good denominations that are out there, some new ones even, like Global Methodist. They do a lot of good work. Free Will Baptists do a lot of good work. The Evangelical Presbyterian Church does a lot of good work. I mean, you can look at certain tribes and go, okay, maybe they have their issues. Everyone does. But overall, that's a pretty good group right there. Um, so I would say let's not just want to discard all that the institution is because without the institution, we really don't have the foundations of our society. Um, so I'm not anti-denominational. We're just talking about what we see. And what's clear is most denominations are in decline and the groups that are growing tend to be either loosely affiliated or networks or just non-denominational. Um, and, and that's just a fact that cannot be ignored, but let's not dismiss the great work that institutions have done and still need to do. I agree a hundred percent. In fact, I'm a denominational geek myself. I'm involved in a lot of different ways and in, in my denomination, but, um, uh, but yeah. Didn't you have think... to step out of a meeting earlier today with me to go to some I... denominational thing? Well, that was actually a thing at my church, but I frequently do have to step out of things. <laughs> Uh, for church answers related things in order to go to my geeky denominational things of which I'm a part. But uh, whether you're denomination or non-denominational, the, the key is keep your eyes on what's most important on the mission Christ has given us. And if you take your eyes off of it, you can have some problems very quickly. Yeah. I, I think another thing that we're seeing, and this is something I see at ground level, and this would be a great research project. So I'm speaking more anecdotally now. I don't really have hard data here. But there used to be some pretty strong distinctives in tribes that are going away. And one that comes to mind is dispensationalism. Um, you know, that's a more of a controversial 
uh, people, well, let me put it this way. People feel very strongly about whether they are dispensational, uh, a dispensationalist or not a dispensationalist. Sure. Uh, sure. And, but, but that used to be a dividing line for a lot of tribes and a lot of churches. If you are not a, uh, you know, a, a pre-trib, pre-mill dispensationalist, you can't work here. You know, that, that used to be a very hard line for a lot of tribes and it's not now. Uh, now some may say, well, it should be. Uh, and others may say, hey, thank goodness, let's, you know, that was not something to fight over. But as we see the decline of denominations, we are also seeing the corresponding decline of theological distinctives. And is that a good thing or is it not? Well, time will tell. I do think some of the walls that we've put up are unnecessary, but I also think some of the walls that I've put up in my own church are very, very important. Um, you know, the mode of baptism, that's just one that's important for me. Uh, love anyone who doesn't agree with me, goodness, we can do gospel work together, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to compromise on that. I, I'm Baptist. I just, I can't, uh, immersion is how we baptize. Not everyone agrees with me and, um, you know, that's okay. And I'm all right with that. And I'm not angry at anybody, but, that's not a distinctive that I want to go in. There's be people who disagree with me and say, yeah, I agree with you. I just think you're wrong. <laughs> I've got my own wall put up in my own church and I think we're right. Um, and we'll all figure out when we get to heaven. Uh, you know, the Presbyterians are all going, yet. Yeah, we know it. We know we're right. You guys just wait. When we, <laughs> we get to heaven, you're all going to see. Um, but, uh, you know, those theological distinctives many times are important. And you can make the argument that we have too many tribes and too many walls and sure i agree but but sometimes they're important yeah i think it's it's uh definitely important my own personal opinions i think the on the local church level uh the, the folks the staff and, and what they teach should agree with the primary issues and the secondary level issues once you get past that to the third or the tertiary level issues i don't know that you have to agree on everything to be a part of the same church but you certainly need to agree on is christ the only way of salvation Yes or no? That church needs to agree on that. What mode of baptism? That would be a, a second level issue for many people. I think that's important. I recall when I was in seminary uh, interviewing for my first full-time ministry position at a church I spoke to. I asked them about baptism. They were a non-denominational church. And they said, you can baptize however you want to baptize. We do it anyway here. And I thought, well, that doesn't sit well with me. <laughs> you know. And so I think uh, as we talk about the rise of non-denominational churches, I think it's important that they understand what they believe and they have the ability to communicate what they believe both to guests and to their own members as they, as they seek to disciple them. Um, that's my personal opinion. I, I don't think um, just because you don't have a denomination, I don't think that means you shouldn't have a core set of convictions about what you believe God teaches in his word. Yeah, the last point that I'll make involves theological education. Um, a lot of what supports theological education is the institution of denominations. In our own tribe, Southern Baptists, we have six seminaries. I've made the argument before that we don't really need six seminaries. Um, but then the decision comes down to, well, which ones go, Sam? And I'm like, you know what? I don't know. They all can justify their existence, but we just don't need six. That being said, if denominations continue to decline and it gets more rapid and we see even more deterioration, for the most part, it's not like non-denominational churches have created institutions for theological education. Some have. There are some that are out there, but there's not nearly as many. And so if we see the institution that is the denomination decline, with that will come a decline in the availability of theological education. Now, I'm sure many people could make the argument, well, if the church was doing its job, we wouldn't need seminaries. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's a good point. Uh, and maybe we are in an era where we're transitioning theological education back to the local church. That's not a bad thing. But seminaries still have, do have a place. They still have a very important place uh, and help, help do train pastors theologically, particularly within their own framework, their own theological framework. And if we don't see denominations continue down a healthy path, one of the implications of that is just a decline in theological education. Absolutely. Not only um, a decline in theological education, but an increase in the expense for those theological educations that remain, because a lot of those are uh, partially funded by giving through denominations. 
And so, yeah, I think we're going to see that. There is one healthy trend, and, and you sort of hinted at this, that I think we do see developing, and that is churches are recognizing how important it is for the education to at least partner with the local church. I think that's something in my day uh, when I was in seminary and you were in seminary around the same time, there wasn't a, it wasn't done very well where we saw a partnership with the local church. In fact, a lot of the real life stuff that I experienced as a pastor, I didn't learn anything about it in seminary. And so I think if, if we see a trend where partnership with the local church is happening, that's a healthy thing. And of course, as you know, um, we have our own uh, Church Answers University. We're working with churches to provide diplomas for those who may not be able to go to seminary or may choose not to go to seminary or may have education in another field, but they want to complement that with some theological, biblical education. So I think we're going to see more of that. I think that's a healthy trend. I like having options out there for folks and let them choose. But I definitely think we need to continue to train people. And I think it needs to be done in partnership with the local church. Yeah, Matt is the dean of Church Answers University. So please give him some love. Go to churchanswers.university and and just go see what is to offer there. We have uh, a lot of good programs and a lot of good diplomas. So uh, I agree with you. And we can even do MTCs, ministry training centers. So you can create a like a little core in your own church to train people up, whether it be all your group leaders or whoever. So yeah, churchanswers.university if you're interested. That's right. That's about all the if you want to train people in your church, we would love to work with you through Church Answers University. Just let us know. There you go. All right. That's about all the time we have for today. But before we go, thank you, Upward Sports. We are incredibly grateful for the sponsorship that you have with us. It's really a partnership. It's not a sponsorship, although you uh, help pay the bills. So thank you, Upward Sports. They have um, a really unique thing that they are doing with us now. So Matt, am I correct in this? We're giving away Know your community, like our demographic report, like our like our number one best selling resource. We're giving it away free. Upward has made it possible for the user to receive it for free. They are receiving it for free. Okay, well, okay. So, <laughs> Upward's been generous in many many ways. This is over the top. So, they are giving know your community demographic reports to you for free. And and I believe that as you do this, you get to schedule a consultation review to go over the report with them. That's absolutely right. Upwards not only making it possible for them to receive the Know Your Community report, they want to walk the person through it to help them understand how it impacts their community. So it's it's a really, really great offer. All right. You gotta get on you gotta get in on this insanity. You just got to get in on it. How do you do that? Upward.org slash church answers. It'll link in the show notes for those of you who are like at your computer, but just file this away if you're in your car or whatever, upward.org slash church answers. Go get a free Know Your Community report and a free consultation with them. That's really cool. All right, guys, we'll see you next week.